Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway. Once again, still without my mic, so I look like a, a doofus with my PlayStation microphone uh, working for me. So and audio, not how I would like. Very frustrating for a former radio guy, but we're going to get through it because we got through it last night for the Sunday show, and I would uh, tell everybody, go check that out if you haven't. Drew and Fan were great on it, as always, talking about the Colorado game, previewing West Virginia, and everything else along the way. Today, have a specific topic in mind that we'll get to, and it relates to the running backs because obviously DJ Giddens had a phenomenal game running the football, had one really big catch for K-State in the game against Colorado. But there were crucial points down the home stretch of the game where K-State didn't use the running game like maybe they should have or people thought they would, and we'll discuss that here in just a little bit. But first, a reminder for everybody, if you're getting excited about where football season is going this year, seems to be building up for Farmageddon and, and K-State, Iowa State at the end of the season. Well, just think, this game probably will be just as important next year because the two most notable guys in that game, Avery Johnson and Rocco Beck, they will be the quarterback at K-State and Iowa State next year, and it's going to kick off the season. So if you want to make sure that you see what could be the most impactful game in the Big 12 next year, you need to find your tickets for the Cats2Ireland.com experience. What better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats and the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland? The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So Cats2Ireland.com if you want to make sure that you are in attendance for Farmageddon next season. I'd also tell everybody, find your way to get to Farmageddon in Ames this year, too. Uh, because if K-State wins, you'll have the time of your life. But if you haven't experienced a game at Jack Trice Stadium, uh, it's certainly an experience. And uh, it's it's a it's a doable drive for most Cat fans out there to, to check another Big 12 stadium off your, your list. Also, just a legitimate chance that that could be the game in Ireland could be the third time that we've had far, that we'll get far again in like a six month stretch. So, yeah, there's also that. Yeah, very true. That is very true, because the way it's trending right now, K-State might need that win at the end of the season. Iowa State's schedules opened up to where that game may not be as relevant for them, and uh, they, that may just be setting up for a rematch a week later in the Big 12 title game. We shall see. What we'll talk about today, though, probably has a direct impact on if K-State makes it to the Big 12 title game and how they perform the rest of the season, because it has to do with their running back usage. If you think back to the game against Colorado on Saturday night, I know that there were some questionable decisions made on the offensive side, at least in fans' mind, and even mine to some extent, uh, with how K-State managed kind of late game situations. So if you think back to the series where K-State is able to go down the field or they go down the field, Colorado ends up getting the ball back, and then Colorado goes on that long, long drive and uh, then Shadur Sanders throws an interception to VJ Payne. K-State comes out. They have the ball on their own 25. Here's what K-State did on that drive. First and 10, Dylan Edwards run up the middle for one yard. Second and nine, Dylan Edwards run up the middle for one yard. And then third and eight, Avery Johnson threw a short one to DJ Giddens that went for four yards, and K-State had fourth and four, and they had a punt. They ended up taking less than two minutes off the clock there. And they couldn't give the ball to DJ Giddens on those first two downs because they were trying to give him a breather and kind of rest him up because running backs are going to deal with season long ailments. They just take a beating throughout the year. And then you think about DJ Giddens in that game, the situation that he was in and, and you go and look at it at that point, I'm trying to see, uh, I think to that stage of the game, he had already had 23 of his 25 carries that he was going to have. Um, he had two more carries later on on the following drive that ended with the K-State interception. But I think there were a lot of people that thought, why are you not giving DJ Giddens the ball here? He's been dominant. And I think it just breaks down to the fact that he'd been used so much throughout that game. He's taken a beating throughout the course of the season that 
they had to, to rest him up somewhere and they couldn't put him out there in that moment. And it obviously led to not being able to have your best offensive player on the field and in a way play the game that you would want to play. So I ask you this, Drew, does K-State need to find a way to better manage DJ Giddens carries throughout the course of the game? And do you have some kind of game plan to how that looks? Because obviously it would include Dylan Edwards, but do you, is it just like straight run or are you trying to be a little bit more creative with your passing game? How, how can this be done? Or maybe I'm just totally wrong here and K-State's going to have to deal with it, how they dealt with it on Saturday, which led to a pretty big three and out late in the game. I'm just not sure how you can really manage it because you want to give him the ball when you can, because like, let's say we play this out in a game where Casey it's like managing DJ Gins's load of carries and they're, they end up falling behind. Then it's like, what did you save him for? So, so I think that there's kind of probably a, a delicate balance. And with the example of Saturday night, you probably look back and that's the drive that I also pointed out that that's probably one that Connor Riley wanted to have back. You probably want to, in that situation, uh, because in an ideal world, you also would have had Avery Johnson's legs on that drive, but you couldn't on Saturday. So in, in an ideal world, you probably go back and you probably throw the ball on first down and see if that opens up things a little bit more. Uh, because if you really look at how the game played out, really from that drive on, KZ really wasn't able to run because Colorado kept sending uh, a lot of people and had a lot more guys in the box and were able to get home a little bit more and more effective. So I think that you probably can manage how uh, DJ Giddens gets used more, but I think that that kind of comes at the expense of your offense might not look as good as it did on Saturday or even as it has the rest of the season because, or the whole season so far, because you're kind of trying to pace a guy instead of just being like, okay, we have this elite running back. Let's just give him the ball. Let's, let's ride it out and see, and once he needs a breather, I think that's a situation where the coaches probably say, we just have to be better on that set of downs. Yeah, I, th there is an element to that uh, where y you do have to, to be better there. And I, maybe in, in that game, I know obviously they're they're managing the, the Avery injury and what might come of that, but um, maybe they do. And again, people would have criticized him if they throw on those first two plays and the ball falls to the dirt and then, oh, OK, you, you barely wasted any time there um, because that's happened before. I mean, think of, of different situations throughout the year where people have been critical of, of time being left in certain situations. But I, I just think that's this is something that's going to continue to come up because as we talked about, K-State has a similar game to what they just played against Colorado coming up this weekend against West Virginia where you might find yourself in that situation late in the game, up seven to 10 points, and you get a crucial drive. Let's put this puppy away. You want to be able to run this thing out, and if the best you can do is playing it safe with the carries that Dylan Edwards gets and just going up the middle, and maybe that's the other way too. Maybe you need to find a better way to get Dylan Edwards out into space as opposed to, like in that moment, if teams are going to really stack it in there on you, Dylan Edwards is not the running back. For, for that situation. That would be DJ Giddens, who's got guys missing tackles and he can run through them. He can step past them. Dylan Edwards can step past guys, but he's going to need, a, he's going to at least need a window there. DJ Giddens gives you a better chance of if there's not a window, he can create one. I mean, DJ Giddens can kind of be like the Kool-Aid man at some points, you know, <laughs> just bust through the wall there on you. But I think this is probably an element where, the creativity has to to come in a little bit more. It can't be just so vanilla. And I I have faith that Connor Riley can do that because we've already seen at points this season, his creativity can kind of go through the roof. I mean, think of how many times he's got a tight end wide open inside like the 15 yard line. He, he did it for Dylan Edwards uh, against Tulane. He did it for Joe Jackson against Tulane. It just got called back. Like he has this in him to get it figured out, but it's a matter now of, the coaching staff, I think applying it to these certain moments, if DJ Giddens isn't going to be able to go there or find other moments throughout a game where 
you're going to be able to take a little bit more off of Giddens. And, and the Colorado game, to be fair, is kind of its own beast because fan told us about it going into it. We saw it bear out. They were so bad against the run that they, you would have been foolish early on in the game to keep going to the air, keep going to the air when Travis Hunter was still healthy and, and they have some very reliable defensive backs. So they do deserve some, some fairness there. Um, but I think it's something to monitor moving forward because you don't want this to become a theme where you get late in the game and you have a crucial drive with maybe only one or two series left and it's a run the ball situation and you've got the best running back in the big 12, but you can't give it to him right there. They're going to have to find some way to make this work a little bit better because I mean, really that drive was crucial to them winning or losing the game. It's very similar We've talked a lot this season about how the Tulane and the Missouri or the Tulane and Colorado games are like Missouri last year or, you know, Iowa State or Texas, where they lost those games and they very easily could have or should have won them or Oklahoma State if they just make the the play at the right time. Missouri is probably the best example because K-State's defense gave the offense the ball enough times last season to where if you just go kill some clock, maybe even get a field goal out of a drive. That game's a lot different. They weren't able to capitalize. If K-State loses to Colorado and Avery Johnson doesn't hit that bomb to Jace Brown, we're having that same conversation again where the offense, that drive where they go three and out after the interception in the red zone, um, we're pointing to that one as the reason why they lost the game. And so for, for K-State, I think you have to try and make sure you're not in that situation again because it'll, it could happen this weekend against West Virginia. We'll see what kind of fight KU has when they come to town. And then you look at it now, Arizona State, Cincinnati, and Iowa State are all shaping up to be games that will probably be you know within a touchdown of each other as teams are currently playing. So the, the, the tight games are not going to get any easier for K-State. They're going to have more and more of them. So I think you have to be prepared and uh, at least make sure that your best player is available when the, the situation specifically calls for him because the situation called for DJ Giddens on Saturday in, in Boulder and they weren't able to go to him. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying. It's For me, I look at it more of just – the whole offense has to be better in that situation. The offensive line with how they blocked for Dylan Edwards on those two plays. I'm not sure if DJ Giddens gets more than two or three yards either. So the whole execution just needs to be better in that situation because yeah, let's say Dylan Edwards pops like a 15 to 20 yard run. Like we're not having this, this discussion really. So, so for me, it's just, okay. DJ Giddens isn't in everybody else needs to step their game up because he's the one that's playing at an all big 12 level right now. And Casey doesn't really have a second player that is in that category just yet. So it's more of everybody needs to step their game up for me. And I think that in the future too, you'll have Avery Johnson's legs that you can utilize because the most dangerous aspect of this team is the ability of Avery to run. And when that's limited against Colorado, it's easier for the defense to just crash down on whoever the running back is. And we, and we saw a little bit of that uh, really in the entire second half. Oh, you're on mute. No doubt about it. All right. Before we close up, uh, I want to do one final thing uh, here because we didn't get to it yesterday in the Sunday show. We didn't do our uh, Big 12 win play show or our race to Arlington. So uh, right now, your top three contenders for Arlington uh, in order, how would you go? I imagine you're probably going to be similar to how everybody watching this is and probably where mine end up being, but I'll let you roll here. Yeah, I still... I'm still going to say K State at number one. I just think that high end, putting everything together, K State is probably the best team. Uh, my number two is Iowa State. Uh, Iowa State's getting all that doorstep of being that number one team. I, I need to see a little bit more from Iowa State, especially on the offensive end, because I think that that's where they've kind of struggled so far this season. But it seems like they have found an ability to run the ball. And I think that that is an important aspect for them that they were really missing all season up until they went to Morgantown and it seemed like they found a running back. Uh, my number three has changed, though. Uh, I am 
I, I am giving BYU credit now. I, I think that BYU is solidly that number three. I, I just don't tr- – they have more things that I think are what I would consider like fluky and could go wrong and against you than probably K-State and Iowa State do. It, it seems like every game BYU plays, the other team just has like a barrage of turnovers. And I just don't know if that is a sustainable thing throughout the season. And I don't know how sustainable Jake Retzlaff's play will be the rest of the year because he has never been as good as he has been this season in his entire career. Yeah, uh, I, I'll say this. They get Oklahoma State next, and Alan Bowman, uh, he likes to give the ball to the other team. So that uh, that might be something to monitor there. And if you watch their game with Arizona, the, the turnovers that Fafita committed were much more of a, like, that's, that's not an anomaly for him and how they kind of came about where we know with K-State, the Giddens fumble was – might be the most unlucky play that K-State is going to have all season, even more so than the, you know, the tipped ball that turned into a, a pick that went 60 yards the other way in Boulder over the weekend. Um, and then, you know, Avery kind of crumbled there with his two interceptions, but on those even, there there was blame to go elsewhere too. Uh, I think the offensive line failed on one of them. I think he and Dylan Edwards weren't in, in communication on, on the screen that got picked off. So, there is a little bit more of a flukiness to K-State's, and but you know Arizona did it. And the good news for BYU, and they deserve credit for this, they've capitalized on it. They're making teams pay. And uh, what they did to Arizona this weekend was pretty impressive with their 41-19 to win. And they're, they're a team that the schedule has opened up in a big way now. They're not going to play maybe until their game in Tempe, the next to last week of the regular season, they're not going to play a ranked team the rest of the year. They play Oklahoma State this weekend, then they're at UCF by week, and then they're at Utah, then KU at home, at Arizona State, and Houston. The schedule has opened up in a big, big way for them. And similar to kind of how we've talked about Iowa State, where if you look at what they've got left, uh, UCF, Maybe Texas Tech will be interesting at KU, Cincinnati, at Utah, and then K-State. Like, they really, at this point, based on how things are shaping up, it's that game at home against K-State. That's easily the biggest challenge they have left. I will – I've changed it up because last week was the week where you probably needed Iowa State or BYU to lose if you were going to keep kind of putting them behind K-State. Neither one did it. I probably would have had Iowa State in the front spot anyways because I think they're one of the two best teams in the Big 12 this year. I think it's them or K-State, and they keep winning. Like, they don't have that bad loss yet. They don't have that, oh, we played like crap, we took a loss, whatever. Uh, So they get the top spot. The schedule's manageable down the stretch. I do move BYU to the second spot now because of the schedule and the fact that they haven't lost yet. We'll just have to see when and if it comes, but for right now, they deserve the the credit and uh, being unbeaten with the tiebreaker over K-State gives them a significant advantage here. And then K-State is third. And I don't know if you look around the rest of the big 12, if anybody could make a real case that anybody else should be involved with that grouping at this point in time. Uh, I think the other contenders based on conference record right now would be obviously Texas tech, They've not lost a conference game yet, um, and they'll have a big one on the road in Ames to start November, and then Baylor, TCU, Colorado, Oklahoma State, West Virginia fill out. So they've got two tough ones left, like no doubt about it, with at Iowa State and then Colorado the next weekend in Lubbock. Colorado deserves consideration here. Same type of deal. Uh, As mentioned earlier, they may not have another ranked opponent on their schedule this season. That game at Texas Tech would probably be the only candidate for it. But after that, they play at Arizona this weekend. That'll be a fascinating game to watch. Cincinnati Tech, Utah, KU, Oklahoma State to close it out. And then Arizona State might be in here uh, for now, but it's a little bit tougher to paint that picture because they're now getting ready to start a stretch where they're going to go at Cincinnati by week at Oklahoma State. Then they're home against UCF, at K-State, the following week, BYU, and then on the road for their Territorial Cup game with Arizona. So the schedule isn't as kind to Arizona State. And I think if you're looking at the the two-and-one or better teams in the Big 12 right now, 
Arizona State probably has the least favorable schedule remaining. So I think uh, Iowa State, BYU, K-State, some order of that, those are the clear-cut top three in terms of the race to Arlington right now. Yeah, I think that I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I just I, I think that there's probably a loss or two left for Iowa State and BYU. And, and to be honest, there's, there might be one for K-State left too because no team, I think, from the big 12 is going to come out of this unscathed. I, I think every team has a pretty big flaw. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right. That'll do it for us today. We'll be back again tomorrow to talk to cats. We'll do a recruiting update for everybody. Uh, a lot of stuff to get to as we'll probably have a, a bigger one the following week because it'll be building up to the KU game where there will be a ton of marquee visitors in the house for it. Uh, but we'll have a, a lot on K-State football recruiting for you tomorrow right here on K-State Online. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.